Hello, I'm Ben Tuman, and welcome to Skipped History. Today's story is the second of two parts about the Attica prison uprising of 1971. I read about it in Blood in the Water by Heather Ann Thompson. We left off in September of 1971, when rising tensions at Attica had reached a boiling point. On the morning of September 9th, a guard named Robert Curtis lit the fuse. As he approached a group of prisoners lined up in a tunnel, intending to deliver a message to the guard who was leading them, prisoners began backing away, fearing they'd been trapped so the guards could beat them. Suddenly, someone panicked, punched Curtis, and chaos erupted. The prisoners beat the guards and made their way into Times Square, a central operations hub. From there, they opened gates so more prisoners could join them, and by 9.15 a.m., 1,281 prisoners congregated in Attica's D-Yard, along with 42 guards and prison employees they'd taken hostage. The Attica prison uprising, which would last for four days, had begun. As their first order of business, prisoners set up a medical table, distributed food and cigarettes, and elected representatives to negotiate with the state. That evening, Russell Oswald, commissioner of the New York Department of Corrections, arrived to discuss prisoners' initial list of demands, which included no physical, mental, and legal reprisals for the uprising, that press be allowed in to witness it, and speedy and safe transportation to freedom in a non-imperialistic country, unless the state could only find flights on frontier. Prisoners had not suffered for years just to pay $5 every time they had to use the lavatory. Oswald agreed to some of these demands, including allowing in members of the press, which is why there's so much imagery of the uprising and footage of people like L.D. Barkley, one of prisoners' elected representatives, making the following speech. We want to allow all New York State prisoners to be politically active without intimidation or reprisal. Over the next two days, negotiations progressed in a seemingly positive direction. Per prisoners' requests, Oswald also allowed in people like famed civil rights lawyer William Kunstler to help them negotiate with the state. And while Attica's men dropped their demand for transportation to a non-imperialistic country, as it turns out, the only connecting flights out of upstate New York were on frontier, their representatives fleshed out a list of 30 demands. Oswald agreed to 28 of them, including providing a healthy diet, minimum wage, and adequate medical treatment. There was, however, a sticking point. Amnesty. Having seen the brutal reprisals suffered by rebels at Auburn State Prison, Attica's men weren't willing to end the standoff until they received legal assurances that there would be no retribution against them for participating in the uprising. This demand took on even more urgency when prisoners learned that William Quinn, a guard injured amid the initial chaos, had died even after inmates rushed him out to the state for medical attention. But Oswald refused to grant amnesty. And on this point, he had support from his boss, Governor Nelson Rockefeller, who unbeknownst to prisoners from the start believed that discussions with them could prove counterproductive. The growing number of agitated state troopers gathered outside the prison agreed, fueled by rumors of prison atrocities. For example, after watching prisoners bring out mattresses from cells so the hostages would have beds to lie on, troopers worried that the hostages were being surrounded by gasoline-soaked mattresses. And when prisoners constructed a platform for the negotiating table, state officials fixated on the possibility that it was intended to be a sacrificial altar and a hangman's platform. Kind of like when I thought my neighbor was trying to hack my email password because he asked for my cat's name. And for the record, my cat's name is not 123456. It's 123456 exclamation point. Meow. So as it turns out, the whole time that Oswald was negotiating with prisoners, Rockefeller's representatives were making plans to retake the prison by force. And as negotiations over amnesty reached an impasse, Oswald himself came to the conclusion that prisoners were not in fact calling for prison reforms, but for revolution and anarchy. On the morning of Monday, September 13th, he sent one last urgent appeal to Attica's men, asking that all hostages be released immediately. But with no inkling that this appeal was a demand, Attica's men rejected it, only realizing that the appeal came with an implied or else when they heard a helicopter that Rockefeller's aides had called in to drop tear gas on the yard. Soon, the air was engulfed with gas, incapacitating every person it touched. Tragically, the violent assault was just getting started. At 9.46 a.m., on orders from Governor Rockefeller, over a thousand troopers and guards poured onto the catwalks and into the yard. They were armed with pistols, sniper rifles, and shotguns, many of which utilized unjacketed bullets, a brutal kind of ammunition banned by the Geneva Conventions. Equipped with gas masks to neutralize the tear gas, troopers shot at point-blank range at incapacitated men waving their hands in the air and begging to be spared. The gunmen made little attempt to distinguish between friend and foe. 
For example, guard Robert Curtis was shot in the back, and another hostage, Mike Smith, was wounded by four bullets that exploded on impact and sent shrapnel down his spine. And even after the shooting stopped, the violence continued, with troopers stripping surviving prisoners and forcing them to run through a gauntlet of officers beating them with batons. Some prisoners received even more elaborate forms of torture. For instance, troopers forced Frank Smith to lie naked for hours with a football balanced on his neck, threatening to shoot him if the ball fell off. Smith survived, but people like L.D. Barkley did not. And by day's end, nine hostages and 28 prisoners were dead. Now, at this point, you might be thinking, what the fuck? So were people around the U.S. in 1971, although probably for different reasons, because of news like this. In the final hours of the revolt, led primarily by blacks, the inmates murdered nine of their white hostages. Yes, right after the attack, prison officials told the press that all of the dead hostages had been murdered by knife-wielding inmates. And to top off these stories, Rockefeller's representatives, knowing that the public's reaction to the retaking could turn into a bit of a nightmare for the governor, released an official statement saying that several of the hostages had been dead for several hours before state moved into the prison in force. Of course, neither of these accusations were true, but they spread all over the country. The day after the retaking, news that several of the hostages died when convicts slashed their throats with knives appeared on the front page of every major national periodical. Soon, letters to editors streamed in, expressing rage toward the murderous convicts, those evil, vicious enemies of society, and also directing anger toward the thoughtless idiots on the outside who support them. Hey. And even though the record was corrected the next day when autopsies showed that shots killed the nine Attica hostages, not knives, the initial onslaught of mistruth left a lasting impression on many people. One New York State senator summarized, as a result of Attica, the public attitude is that we've got to get tougher. That means putting more people in prison. Rockefeller heard the message loud and clear and got to work on passing a set of draconian drug laws mandating harsh sentences for low-level offenders. Over the ensuing decades, state legislators around the country duplicated these laws in ever more punitive forms, leading to more people in prison. In fact, if you look at a graph of the U.S. prison population over time, although the war on crime began in 1965, the U.S.'s dramatic spike in incarceration rates began directly after Attica. And yes, various factors contribute to the spike at that particular point in time. But a major cause was the flood of laws inspired by the racist lies spread by the Rockefeller administration after killing dozens of prisoners. Fast forward to today, Attica remains just as overcrowded as in 1971. And according to a recent report, staff violence, brutality, intimidation, racism, and abuse remain pervasive. Meanwhile, in a series of trials that lasted for decades and involved a systematic cover-up of evidence, almost no one was ever held accountable for the violence that ended the uprising, Prisoners and families of slain hostages only agreed to $12 million settlements with New York State in the 2000s, and New York still refuses to apologize for the violence, which is bewildering and maddening, aka exactly what it's like when me and 123456 exclamation point meow, fly frontier. Ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately we've encountered a slight delay. There's a mechanical problem with your plane. And speaking of bad deals, in the early 1970s, the U.S. government ended a troubling arrangement with Native American tribes. Tune in next time to learn more about that bit of skipped history.